Privet, and welcome to That Eurovision Podcast, Eurovision with a slice of life. Uh, my name is Rory, and I'm doing very well today. I am sweating profusely because it is absolutely gorging outside. I'm not used to it. I'm probably burnt to a crisp right now after coming back from a nice little walk around sort of my area. But, um, you know, we don't really get this that, that often. So, you know, we're going to have to try and make the most of what we have. So, yeah. And uh, joining me? Uh, Jazzy, um, I can share the sentiment that it is quite hot here today. Um, unlike Rory, I have, however, not left my house today. I just looked outside and thought, nope. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I was like, nope, too hot today. I'm not going anywhere. No. Nope. <laughs> and it's Rosie here. And I have been at work all day. But it's quite lovely because... Um, so the, the room I work in is on the sort of the first floor of um, a three-story house. So ground floor, middle floor, upper floor. So I'm working on the middle floor. But for some reason, there is a door on the middle floor that you can open up and it goes out onto part of a roof. So it's really weird. I've had that open all day. And so I've just had sort of the breeze and the light coming in. And it has been very pleasant while I've been working. Aww. Sounds very cosy and very sort of light and breezy. That's how it has been. Aww. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, hi, Tim here. Just finished work as well. Um, not a bad day. And I can share the same sentiment of Rory where it's just really hot. And if you do hear something in the background, I just bought a little portable aircon because I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. Like if you live in England, then you know it's been like this pretty much since the start of lockdown. And yeah. we've had enough. Can't yeah, relate. So I my... Ha ha, you're all in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> and the sun's like, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, I've, ha- I've literally bought one and I was like, thinking, I was like, okay, good thing I did because I've got three more months of this. <laughs> and I'm not going to put up with it sweating <laughs> yeah you might as well prepare for a long time to come now so i mean <laughs> invest in some like really useful things long term <laughs> exactly yeah oh. but um yeah so in this episode we're we're not going to be jetting off to a country that would sort of have these fantastic hot temperatures that we've been experiencing at the moment instead we're going to go somewhere that's uh pretty much as far away from that as you could possibly get and you may have maybe guessed from our introduction it's russia so yeah russia has had one win in its participation in the contest and that was with dima bilan and believe in 2008 and it has however only suffered one non-qualification and that was yulia samoylova in 2018 with i don't break and oh. yeah <laughs> so no <laughs> it's a sh- i'm it's a shame that. Uh, yeah, I know. I remember being in the arena for Julia, and I saw her when she didn't qualify. That was sad. I have a lot of opinions about that song. <laughs> <laughs> is this the, is this the all time worst entry of all time? Is it? It is the only Eurovision song that I would specifically say I hate. Ooh. Like every other song, there are songs I don't like because. But the only song I have such strong feelings about is that one. And that is because I think it is so disgustingly exploitative. And there's an interview that um, Yulia did with Wee Wee Blogs a couple of months after. And she basically says that she had absolutely no autonomy in anything that she was doing. And she felt really sort of anxious and used. And it's just really horrible to read. And you kind of get that watching it on stage. And I just, I absolutely despise everything that the Russian delegation stood for the couple of years that they tried to send her because she even says that she felt really tokenized the year they tried to send her to Kiev and I'm absolutely not okay with how she was treated. Oh, controversial! <laughs> I, I feel bad now because like I actually kind of enjoy the song because like like usually Myself, I'm not a big fan of of Russian songs in in the contest just because I feel like a lot of the songs that they pick are usually kind of generic or sort of formulaic and it just feels like they're trying to sort of not pander per se, but they're kind of more trying to 
appeal to the vast majority by kind of going with the lowest kind of common denominators that would bring success. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I did just enjoy that song just because I, I don't know really why. I think it, it just had a nice sort of melodic tune to it. I don't necessarily kind of... I, I wasn't necessarily paying that much attention, I guess, to the whole sort of over-politicized thing of 2018 because I had personally figured, I guess, that uh, like that whole time was just left in 2017. But... Um, yeah, hearing that now, I guess it's just a bit uh, disheartening. <laughs> like, yeah. it felt very different for Russian entry. Mm. Like, usually, like, I, I feel like I Won't Break wasn't as formulated as a lot of the Russian entries are. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was quite nice. However, it's definitely not the best song they've ever sent. And I can see why it didn't qualify, of course. Mm. I don't mm -hmm. actually have a huge issue with the song in and of itself from a, like a melodic sense or from a lyrics point of view or any of that. It's the whole sort of what that song stands for that I really dislike. Okay. Like I don't I don't like how Russia tried to almost take the attention away from her mm -hmm. like with the camera shots that they used and stuff like that. You even like see they, it in the I music like video. I feel like hide her, and I don't think that's a good thing. It almost felt as if the Russian delegation, etc., were ashamed to have her as a representative. But in 2018, they had to. Because yeah. Of what happened in 2017. And you even and see. I, I remember like the first time watching the music video for for I Won't Break, and it was like they are li they are obscuring that she's a disabled woman. Like you don't. You, the shots of her are proper like face close-ups or sort of artsy shots of volcano going up you don't see the whole person that she is and it feels it felt like like jazzy said that they were so ashamed of having her and i felt so bad for yulia and she deserved better yeah she definitely, she definitely deserved better treatment than what she got Mm. I think with what it is is that this is one of the reasons why you should always have if you're internally selecting an artist you need to make sure that the artist is involved with the song yeah. with the process yeah <laughs> you, like you, with you, just you... anything in general mm -hmm. like because it really felt like Yulia had absolutely no control of anything to do with her participation and then when she didn't qualify like I've seen the videos it's just really really sad no, I think with this one, Sorry, I think on. with this one as well, um, you hear, I mean, I really like the studio version, and then when it came to the live performance, when they had the Moscow pre-party before oh. everyone went to head on over to Lisbon, oh, no. and, and I watched that, and I'm like, oh my god, no! Oh. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know, that the Moscow Pre party, she was practically at Gemini level, um, of key, like out of tuneness, <laughs> and it was it was it was almost kind of heartbreaking to see. But I think she, she did definitely recover, like, and she did like improve significantly compared to like from like from Moscow to Lisbon. But even you can see mm -hmm. in some of the the camera shot she's not actually even singing in a couple of them but um yeah which is a shame i do hope that um yulia is doing well and i do hope that she's sort of going on and doing good things because you know she deserves it and i do think that hopefully things mm -hmm. will not be as controversial going forward Justice with her for yulia just f in the chat for Justice yulia guys for yulia. F in the chat f in the chat <laughs> but um so maybe maybe just to kind of bump things up a little bit, what would be your sort of favorite entry from Russia from of all time? Mine's a bit of a weird one. Um, it's Northern Girl two thousand and two. Okay, Ooh. Prime Minister. I, Prime Minister. I love a boy band, and with that, I get exactly what I want. I just really like it. Um, I, to be. I've got to credit ESC Radio for this one because if I didn't listen to ESC Radio as much as I have through the lockdown, I probably wouldn't even know this song existed. Shout out to ESC Radio so for educating us all. <laughs> and um, 
yeah, it's just like it's just something that's like really grown on me the last few weeks, and now it is probably my favorite Russian entry, just because it's everything that I want in a song like outside of the context, like that two thousand boy bandy vibe is just something I've listened to outside of the contest, so I just think it it appeals to my musical taste. Although I probably see that objectively it probably isn't the best song Russia have ever sent. It's more it's definitely more of a subjective thing. I think probably my favourite and I feel like I'm gonna be really proper properly sort of mainstream with this is actually Uno. I really, really like it. I think uh, yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can get behind that. Yeah. Yeah, I can get like, there. Are, there are a couple that I sort of thought of, like Lost and Forgotten is kind of iconic and it's been in my head for weeks. <laughs> Specifically that bit where he's like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I'm looking at I do, I do. Throw them to the fire. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. But actually, I think Uno is just the sort of political aspect of it I really enjoy the subversiveness of it and it is also just an absolutely joyful bop and the more I listen to it the more I enjoy it <laughs> oh yeah well um, Uno being the most viewed video on the Eurovision channel mm-hmm. for the 2020 and also the fact that it's on its way to the Thornetta like literally oh wow because <laughs> Netta's got the Netta's got the most viewed video. It's li- It can literally. I don't know. Maybe by the time of release, he'll be like it's cinched closer, even beaten it already. Oh, I feel like we're gonna like Ooh. we're we're gonna be here, and we're gonna be we're gonna be the first people to sort of make history by saying that it's gonna happen. Like it's gonna happen. <laughs> it will. It will. It will happen. It will happen. It will happen. Oh, like yeah. you, you, you get a hundred million views within two months. Come on. That's very true. And I mean, Little All Big right. as well are very, like, big names anyway. So, like, of course, mm-hmm. they're going to, that's going to generate sort of views, especially for a song that was going to be performed in front of 200 million people. So that would have bump up the numbers significantly anyway. For me, my favourite Russian entry, I will say this, that um, I knew, I didn't, I, I've heard about it before, like, when I started watching Eurovision, but then I didn't really listen to it much further until later on. But yeah, my number, my favorite Russian entry is Cerebr- Cerebro. Oh, God. I, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just butchered their names. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Cerebro and song number one. I'm just going to say that's how you do a girl group performance. Okay. Other than, other than American, of course, just because of the fact that... They they were sleek, it was well rehearsed, and the vocals and the harmonies were there. And that that third place was deserved. So I'm completely happy with that. I do think that like I don't know why, but I mean I never really understood Sarah Bro like as like a as a favorite. But like I guess looking watching the like the performance again, like during the two thousand and seven sort of Eurovision again, we did a review on that if you want to check that out. Shameless self promo. <laughs> Um, but I, I never really understood, like, how it was seen as a favourite, but, I mean, watching the performance back, I do think that it did have that kind of rock chick. The, Sarah Bro did right what Tattoo got wrong, I think, is is the main thing. But, um, yeah, my, my number one is, it's, I, I think it's highly sort of underrated in the fandom. And I do wish that, uh, like, a lot of people did see more potential in it. It's Mamo, 2009. Oh, um, of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Cause, yes. Because it's, it's filled with, like, drama, emotion. It's in two different languages, Russian and Ukrainian, which, I mean, looking at that now, I mean, that's a bit of a controversial Yikes. take. Um, <laughs> but it like... The, the actual performance itself was really simple and but it was still really effective and I think just like having the effect of like her gradually aging with the performance I think that's like really sort of like innovative really and I was kind of sad that it only managed to get 11th place but I do think that like Russia does has had uh, some good songs along the way but usually I'm not a big fan of the songs just because of what I was saying earlier it's kind of 
generic and formulaic, but this one just seemed different. It seemed a lot more sort of, not personal per se, but it had a bit more input from Anastasia Krikochko herself. Yeah. It felt very, like, seeing her aging and just seeing how, like, emotional she was performing the song. Yeah, it just, it just made it seem a lot more personal, I think, yeah. and... I d yeah, I felt like she was singing about her. Birth. Oh yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's the topic of the song. I sh I, I think Mama is mother in Russian or Ukrainian. I'm not quite sure. But yeah. like, it I... really felt like she was singing, like singing to like her parents, and like that is a very different take for a song in Eurovision. Like we don't see many songs where. Their parents are kind of the inspiration behind the song. Mm. So, and it felt very emotional, very personal to her. It just felt a lot more, I don't want to say real, but like authentic and that it actually meant something to, to the artist. Unlike a couple of Russian entries, definitely in recent years have felt. Yeah. I think with, um, with, with Anastasia, I think, I think, I think it's to do with like her telling her mum about her breakup or something like that. I, anyone who knows the actual meaning of the song, please do get in touch. I, I don't know. It just seems, it just seemed very, like you said, authentic and very sort of personal. So I, I do think that it did get a good placing in, in Moscow. It did come 11th, I think it was. So they just missed the top 10. Right. But, and 2009 is seen as a very, very strong year. Very true. So, she did do well. It's just a shame that, um, I, I don't, I don't necessarily know if, um, if any of you know about this, but actually, obviously when it comes to Russia and Eurovision, politics do still manage to kind of creep into, into the kind of idea of like participation and who is representing them. It's something that I did talk about in my dissertation. Uh, if, if any of you want to like what, read my dissertation, please do let me know and I will I will send it to you. Um, it's worth the read, it's great. It is really mm -hmm. worth the read. Oh, thank you. I did get 80% in it as well. I'm very proud. <laughs> you well, read my dissertation. <laughs> I mean... Which admittedly wasn't on Eurovision, but fair. Hey. You know, it's all good. We've all we're all academic people here, um, <laughs> but uh, no, with with this idea that um, it needs to be a Russian representing Russia. Obviously, Anastasia Prikhochko, she is originally from Ukraine. So when Mamo did end up winning the selection in Russia in 2009, there was actually a lot of backlash because they believed that she was almost like a lesser because she was like not from Russia, she was from a lesser country. And I think that it plays into that kind of like um, identity that it needs to be a Russian representing Russia. And it, it, it kind of has kind of transferred a little bit in the sense that look at Ukraine now, as in it needs to be a Ukrainian representing Ukraine. So it the, the, there's a lot of kind of nuances, especially within the way that like Russians pick the entry as well. Just say for saying, for example, like Russia hasn't actually had a national selection since 2012. So do yep. you think that maybe Russia should be given the chance to kind of come back and actually have a national selection again? Or do you think that um, like what Channel One and uh, like Russia, Russia 24 should be like, should they just kind of carry on with what they're doing? Um, I kind of like they, I feel like Russia are kind of focusing on trying to get their big, big star to take part in Eurovision. And I imagine if there was a national selection, then they wouldn't, because then there's a risk of them losing. So it's not a, like it would be something I'd like to see because I'd like to see like some smaller Russian artists try and take the take the stage and see if they could emulate the success that these big stars have had. Albeit, I think that like, the smaller stars actually have said better songs that feel more raw and more authentic to the artist. Um, whereas all the big stars, a lot of their songs seem quite formulated, although I'll say Little Big is definitely a step, with Uno is definitely a step in the right direction for Russia, where 
the song was very much authentic to them, but very much accessible to the masses at the same time. I think one thing that is sort of a bit weird, and I know that this is not all entirely their fault, but since 2016, up until at least this year and quite possibly next year, they'll only have sent three different artists. That's very that's a that's a very hot take there, isn't it? <laughs> like Sergey, two years, Yulia, two years, and then possibly Little Big, two years. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. I feel like with the Little and Big like I say, one... not all of that is their fault because they can't. I don't think Russia started the coronavirus <laughs> just to send Little Big twice. But... Conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, the Illuminati <laughs> might be listening. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's... that's. It's strange. On the one hand, you've kind of got them standing by their artists and wanting to celebrate success and things like that, but at the same time, I don't necessarily know how pure their motivation is, to th is for that. And on the one hand, if they keep sending good songs, and actually I feel... Like, like, I'm one of those people that actually quite likes both of Sergei's entries. Like, I don't think they're anything sort of revolutionary, but I enjoy them and I still listen to both of them. And there's also my favourite fact on the site that Sergei Lazarev is the Russian dub of Troy Bolton in High School Musical, which means he's already <laughs> released a song called Scream. That answers so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me very, very happy. Like, uh, my take on Sergei Lazarev is that his songs are good, they're quality. Um, I can argue 2016 probably did deserve the third place because the staging was pretty on point. However, there were better songs in 2019 than yes, Scream. That yeah, I would definitely. Agree with. Um, <laughs> I just, it, 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 it's just beyond me. How <laughs> this song came third. <laughs> like, I'm actually I, okay with it being in the top ten, but there are other songs in the top ten that I think were better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, literally. The one that I'm going to actually go to, which was better song-wise, staging. Well, there's two. It would be Kainu and Kate that I thought they felt more like top three entries. Yes. Yeah. They did, and I thought, mm. yeah. And wild card for Hatari because Hatari stands forever. <laughs> yeah, same. Hatari step on Rosie. <laughs> Please. <laughs> All of them. And then step on me. <laughs> Please. <gasps> They're my age as well. It's okay. We're planting the seed again. We're planting seeds again. Please. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> Oh, dear. All right, then for me, I, what I really like about Russia is that they don't fix what's broken. Yeah. It seems that their methods are working, well, in the exception of 2018, but it seems that ever since they've reverted back to internal selection, they've mostly been at the top 10. So fix what's not broken. But the only thing I will say about that is I know that sometimes Russian artists don't get enough headway. <laughs> time-wise and whether or not they've been selected i mean, didn't little big get selected like two or three weeks before the deadline or something? yeah and then they had to literally apparently with little big um, they got the idea for the song when they came back from vacation in february we don't know when in february but i think i think it might have been late february so you'd think that oh god the heads of delegation meeting is in two weeks stuff <laughs> And then, obviously, um, it only took them a few days, and they were able to produce that. So imagine if Little Big were confirmed now, then we'll just have this long sporadic way where they find their way and hopefully pick a song. And from what I've heard, they're keen to come back. And yeah, they're the keen to come back. Heavy keen to participate in the first place, which does... Make me well. very, very happy and I would and love to see a, them come back. It's a mutual agreement. So all I'm going to say is not Channel One, but to the other broad. Uh, rather, see, is it not cha is it, is it's, it Channel it's One? Cha it usually is Channel One, but I think it's now VGTRK or something like that. Yeah, so for the other broadcaster, please, for the love of God, just agree with the people. Yeah. And you know, you might, when you might have an actual 
act who will actually land yourself a televoting winner. Ooh. Give that's the people not, what they want. Even a win in general. That that that's not that's not a shade to a certain act. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh. Nick is. Let me just pick up on the other thing that we were talking about. I re I don't have a problem with Sergey. Like, I applaud him as an artist and an effort. But I, his Eurovision entry screams desperation. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, oh. I've listened. To I think he's just got a lot of feelings, and he has better songs. Yeah, he has he better songs. This is the thing. Like both of his entries feel formulated to try and win, and you're barking up the wrong direction here. Mm. That's no, all I'm gonna I don't say. disagree with that. Just sometimes they press the right button in me, especially <laughs> like angsty songs with violins. Just they scratch an itch. <laughs> if it works, it works, you know. Yes. Yeah. But if it works for them and lands them a top five result, I'm not complaining. Well, I mean, it obviously shows that something is working. I guess. I do. I do miss though a, a Russian national selection. I think, you know, it, it's kind of nice to think that the last that came through a national selection was the Boronovsky Babushki. That was the last time that Russia had a national selection and it paid off for them because they came second. And of course, Peter, Peter Nalich and, and friends came in, I think it was ninth or it was either ninth place or 11th place. It's, it was one of them um, in 2010. And then obviously 11th place coming again with with uh, Anastasia Prokhorchko in 2009. Um, I, I, I do wish, though, that we did get more of an idea of what Russia's sort of music scene is like, because we do have a lot of sort of good Russian artists who obviously do want to take part, like, you know, like Little Big, and, uh, but there are other sort of artists that do kind of need the spotlight. And I think, you know, like how we were talking about, it's kind of sad that only in the space of, what, five years, we've only had, what, three artists. So mm-hmm. it, it does sort of leave a bit to be desired. But I, I, coming back to sort of Sergei, I think, I don't know. Personally, I never really understood the hype for Sergei. I never, mm-hmm. like, I never took... Yes. I never really took to, um, to You Are The Only One because I, I, I'm... And this is, going to, this is going to offend Sergei stands, but bear with me. <laughs> oh but, my God, here we go. <laughs> I have an inherent disliking of Schlager, right? And what, like, Sergei does, his usual sort of musical style is sort of bubblegum pop, 2000s pop Schlager, that kind of dated pop that kind of... it, it. it seems like it belongs in the world, but it really, it's just kind of, it's timeless in the wrong way of being timeless. So, like, like that's why I never really took to You Are The Only One. I mean, saying that, I mean, watch people still say, oh, because you like 1944, doesn't make a difference in that sense. But, um, but in 2019, it was like, I was able to enjoy it somewhat more because I was able to kind of take it a bit more seriously. But again, I don't think it really necessarily deserved the top three. Um, mm. I think I think people liked the song more because he was a returning act who had a lot of high expectations because obviously he'd come, he'd come third in 2016. So everyone was expecting him to kind of come back for his revenge and that kind of thing. And it didn't really happen. Yeah. So, like when I heard the song, when I heard Scream for the first time, and this is not going to go down well, Sergey Stan, I don't think I felt as disappointed in a Eurovision entry in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> he was hyped up so much, and the song just does about as much for me as Sound of Silence did in 2016. <gasps> wow, okay. Like, I got the, like... I get the same vibes, like, you're good, you're good quality, but you don't do anything for me. And I was very much, I was like, I didn't mind whether Sergei Audrey won in 2016, because as I've just said, I had a bit of a dislike for Sound of Silence. So anything but Danny. (laughs) 
<laughs> no! Anything but damning! Like, there was like this whole Sergei Jamala war going on, and I was like, anyone but Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, she's coming for you in 2022. <laughs> oh, I really hope I do like the song in 2022. <laughs> because I think it, I think it's probably my most controversial Eurovision opinion. Ooh. So, I was happy. Yeah, so yeah, basically, I was happy for Jamala or Sergei to win in 2016, out of the big face. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do hope though that um, going forward, you know, we do start to see a bit more varied of a of a Russian music scene because having the same like three or four people coming back, like say for example, in a lot of sort of Eurovision fandom both Facebook groups, Reddit groups, I think I've seen a couple of them, and, like, people c commenting on Twitter. I've seen a lot of people hoping to see Polina Gagarina come back. And yes, she is a very good artist, but, again, it's kind of going in the same, like, style of what San Marino's doing, where it's like, it, do you have, do you just not have any more singers anymore that you're just having to recycle the same people over and over again? Mm. Yeah. And with San Marino, at least it's excusable. Like, Russia's about 30 gazillion times bigger than San Marino. <laughs> this is an open call like, to Russia. Diversify your music scene. Like, <laughs> Russia, biggest population, biggest landmass, biggest country in the whole is, that takes part in Eurovision. San Marino is... Like, you cannot compare the two. Yeah. Actually, coming somewhat, diverging a little bit somewhat from it, it always seems that um, a lot of Russia's songs are at least somewhat kind of involved with, um, like, Philip Kirkorov, essentially. <laughs> and, and You don't I'm say. Shocked. <laughs> I know, yeah. pretends to be shocked, GIF, you know. But I, it's, not like, it's, not he, it's not like he was exposed everywhere this season. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I, I, I do wonder, maybe, like, obviously Philip Kirkrov is a big sort of musical oligarch, especially within the, with the musical scene in Russia. But um, I wonder what it would be like, say, if he wasn't involved in, in the production of something like that, like, for at least a couple of years, just to see what it would be like. Because it, it kind of almost harks to Latvia, for example, with An Aminata. So, like, Aminata participated herself, came sixth, then wrote Heartbeat for use in 2016, that qualified, and then the 2017, her first year that she wasn't sort of involved in the production or the of the song, they came last. Then 2018, didn't qualify again. 2019, didn't qualify again. 2020, Samantha Tina, everyone seemed to think that it would be a qualifier. So I wonder, it it's almost like, obviously he knows what he's doing because we have like the dream team. So we have, you know, Dimitrios Kontapoulos and Philip Kirkorov, etc. But surely there should be something kind of different? I, like, mm -hmm. I, I'm like, am I being like unreasonable? I don't, I don't really know, you know? Imagine having a Eurovision where the like the theme is no Kirk, no Kirkorov, no Jason. Oh God! And no Laurel Barker. So good. It's just like. Oh no! You did not. <laughs> like Eurovision twenty twenty five. Hashtag I mean, no if there's Kirkorov, no, no Jason, no. <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Jazzy. If there's no Laurel Barker, could Melfest even happen? Ooh. <laughs> hmm. So we, I, we need to talk about your life choices. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. But um, sort of like, sort of going forward, what do you think? Like the like, what do you think? Like Russia should kind of do just to kind of, because obviously with um, its past few years, Russia has kind of been seen to be very unpopular among the fandom. So why? So first off. What do you think Russia should do to kind of sort of counteract the the negative perceptions and and then second maybe just kind of who would be your kind of top pick to kind of go for Russia if you know any artists of course. I mean, my first pick to improve their image would be stop killing gays. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gonna be 
be savage. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but anyway, go on. I think. I think if I wanted to see something sort of different from them, I'd probably say I'd like to see something that's kind of folk inspired, um, something kind of along the lines of examples from other countries, uh, Solove or Nova Dessa, um, something that's sort of quite modern, but has that sort of like traditional sort of heritage to it. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, on something I want to see from Russia, I kind of grew rosy. Like, I want to see something, like, ethnic and something that feels very authentic there. Um, the one thing for me that I feel that Russia could do to make themselves more popular within the Eurovision fan base is to drop Kikarov and the Dream Team. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> the songs that they send do not feel like they are relevant to 2020. They feel quite dated. And sometimes they stage them well and I come to them, but there's other times where I'm just like, this belongs in like 2008 and we're in 2020 and it doesn't work anymore. They, they, they're in 2008, but they're also 2000 and late. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As Fergie once said. Um, for me, um, I don't mind their selection method. If it's working for them, and they're saving them money instead of, like, using it to do a national final, they then could use that money towards staging. The only thing I could say to them is try and diversify your, prof- try and diversify your selections and also maybe send something in your own language again. We haven't seen an entry which had a hint of Russian language since 2011. <laughs> so... Yes, I would be happy if, you know, countries have their language in their entries. I mean, it's isn't your vision about promoting your culture? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the, that's almost like the sort of ethos of the whole contest, isn't it? To, like, mm-hmm. show your culture, show your country, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, I think a big part of the reason why not, like, why so many people aren't a fan of Russia first off is definitely because of like the politics that goes on off of the Eurovision stage and of course that is going to have an effect on like what people perceive of Russia especially like during like say for example 2014 the amount of booing that the Tom and Chubby sisters got in 2014 because of a the um annexation of Crimea and then also the LGBT propaganda law I think that was that was kind of the pinnacle of it again Again, with 2015 as well, because obviously when Russia, when Polina used to get 12 points, there would be a lot of people who would boo and therefore it would sort of taking away from it. And you can see that it was getting to her, especially when Conchita in the, the halfway point of the voting had to like tell people not to boo anymore because it's not fair. Um, She's a saint. Yeah, Conchita, well, Conchita mm-hmm. is Jesus. We know that. But... Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think uh, something to make them a little bit more popular, I think, is, well, first off, maybe try to not be so problematic off of the Eurovision stage, so then it kind of fosters a somewhat more stable sort of relationship with the Euro fandom. But then also, I think another thing that could be done is just take a risk, you know? Because I feel like Russia, I think Russia's main goal is to get this win, and then to show that, yes, we are mighty. And because look at how Russia held the contest in 2009. Like it was a big, massive spectacle and mm. they wanted to sort of flex their muscles almost. And I think like since then, Eurovision has kind of come to a point where, you know, it's countries that aren't necessarily being this sort of formula that I guess sort of love, love, peace, peace kind of talks about. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's not like it's kind of we've kind of moved on from that so it's kind of something to kind of maybe think but yes have, maybe have something in another language maybe have something in uh, in another genre that we might not have heard before from Russia I think the last time we heard anything like somewhat folky from Russia would have been either Party for Everybody or Lost and Forgotten that kind of sense um <laughs> But I, I, I would love it if uh, 
if kind of artists like Ava Polna came for Russia or Toma, Toma I think is is definitely one to watch. I think she's very um, up and coming. If if you like that kind of if you if you like Hurricane, you'll like kind of Toma and you'll like Ava Polna, etc. So I think like if these kind of artists were able to come back and have their chance, I think it would start to just bring a lot more kind of diversity to Russia. And I think celebrate diversity, <laughs> celebrate diversity in a country that you couldn't even take part in. <laughs> but um, nah, I, I do hope though that sort of that the Euro fandom does start to warm to Russia a bit because it does feel like at, at this point, it's very grating just to see unnecessary Russia hate. Because, you know, like, they are making an effort. They do pump millions of euro and millions of your relevant currency into the contest. So I think, you know, to ha- they should have their efforts rewarded for sure. Um, mm-hmm. I do just hope, though, that the Euro fandom does kind of ease up a bit. Because it's getting to a point now where it's like, you know, you kind of almost don't really want to mention the word Russia without everyone jumping. Being like, oh, no, no, no. And... You know, it's it's sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not, you know. I feel like when they hit, they really hit, and when they miss, they kind of really miss. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because, like, I feel like this year there seemed to be a little bit of a tide turning in how popular Russia were, and I kind of feel like it's because the entry felt a little bit more authentic to the artist and mm. enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And it didn't just... And it was quite... In... Oh, go for it, worry. No, I was just saying, um, it was... It just felt like it wasn't trying to be competitive, if you understand what I mean. Like, as in, like, it wasn't following this formula in order to, like, get a good result. It was just the fact that this is the style that Little Big usually perform, so they're kind of just doing themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that it was quite an interesting year this year with... Um, you almost had that sort of trio of songs that were sort of male-fronted bands with songs that had a catchy hook and a dance routine of um, sort of Russia, Lithuania and Iceland. And it was always quite interesting to see the differences in um, reception of all of those. But honestly, I liked all of them. I thought they were all great and they were really fun and they were great songs and yes they were I don't think that they're all the same I think that there's definitely differences between them but I quite enjoyed having that sort of trio of songs they felt like a little family to me yeah they, yeah definitely I I've noticed like the ESC radio was like kind like everybody was like kind of like champion ice champion in Iceland everyone was saying Iceland there but then when you've looked at the ESC radio like Lithuania won both best song of the year and the best group so it kind of shows that although local and obviously little big have that 100 million views so i personally do think that when it comes to eurovision fans and eurovision itself uh, russia and lithuania would have probably both done better than iceland and i feel like that's a controversial opinion in itself I do feel like if the Eurovision had gone ahead, that is what would have happened. Are we planting? Are we doing like our own like sort of Mystic Meg predictions here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. So just before we start to wrap things up, is there any sort of like final points anyone wants to make about Russia or? They should keep doing what they're doing, but they should also take maybe take a bit of a risk. Like they've had good, they have good results at the moment. They would have got a good result in 2020 like maybe take us you can take a small risk at times mm. and that would be my advice keep doing what you're doing but p.s for the love of god for the sake of your sanity select little big for 2021 please please please, please. otherwise we... what are you doing man <laughs> i'm looking at their photos throw them through the fire <laughs> it's gonna be me lying in my bed. <laughs> it's like literally, little big will just be here. Are we lost and forgotten? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. I do think you know what we we are in need of a bit of crazy Russia, and I think this is the time for it. And you know, 
if it ends up boding well, hey, I'm all for um, going to Russia again if it means that we have a fantastic show as how we did in Moscow 2009. So, you I know. just want to see Dima Balan catch his jacket on something again. Oh, my God. <laughs> To be fair, though, it would be nice to go to Eurovision where it would be a hassle to get to get into the country and it will be worth it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, dear. But, um, yeah, so this brings us to the end of this episode of that Eurovision podcast, the 10th episode. I mean, if you've been Ooh. listening to any of Ooh. these, thank you so much for, like, supporting us because, you know, we're just doing this for the sake of it and, you know, we're hoping that it's it's, you know, providing you with something nice to listen to whether if you're on the bus or if you're on the toilet or whatever you're listening to us from. <laughs> <laughs> we don't discriminate here you know <laughs> don't, don't discriminate talk about, don't talk bliss, about the toilet right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we do not discriminate tolerance is bliss as rosie was singing potla punk knew what was up mm. Um, As I said on Twitter this week, if you don't like that song, you have no heart. Oh, oh. I mean, I wasn't None. a big fan of it when it first came out, you do but not it's okay. Have a single heart. No, can I have part of a heart? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll have a part of a heart. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for just sticking with us as we just kind of just chat for about 45 minutes and you just get to listen in and join in and and you know we have we have a lot more plans coming up so you know please do follow us on all of our social media instagram facebook twitter at that euro podcast we're also on spotify as well so please make sure you get notified so you know when a new episode is coming out and also if you have any ideas of uh what you'd like to hear us talk about uh please do let us know because you know we're open to suggestions please and yeah so um shall we all say goodbye bye bye, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs>